Welcome to Wide Receiver One, a Blue Wire podcast presented by WinBet. I'm your host, Chris Carter, Pro Football Hall of Fame wide receiver. And today I'm talking to the man, the myth, and the legend, former Detroit Lions wide receiver, Calvin Johnson Jr. Yes, Megatron himself. The Georgia native was a monster on the field during his nine seasons with the Lions, six consecutive Pro Bowl appearances, a first ballot College Football Hall of Famer induction, and also first ballot member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I was able to witness the monumental moment for the wide receiver this year in Canton, Ohio. Welcome to the club, Calvin. I bet that gold jacket feels nice, doesn't it? Now, what's next for the newly minted Hall of Famer? Stay tuned for my interview with Pro Football Hall of Fame wide receiver, Calvin Johnson Jr. Today, I'm very, very excited because I'm able to talk to the man, the myth, the legend, Detroit Lions great, and another wide receiver, of course, Calvin Johnson Jr. Calvin, welcome to the show. Chris, what's up? Thanks for having me, man. All good. Now, I got to give our fans a little treat here because you're not going to get a lot of sound bites about Calvin Johnson. You're not going to get a lot of quotes and everything like you were (laughs) the model as far as being not in the headlines when you played. But one morning, I think you'll remember this. I was doing the Mike and Mike show. And just out of the blue, and 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 and, and Greeny is a good <laughs> friend of mine. Just out of the blue, Greeny's like, "Hey, give me your top five wide receivers." And I said like three guys, and then I said two more guys, and that was the list. And then then Greeny was like, "Calvin Johnson's not on the list." And for me, I tried to get smart and tried to do something quick witty and say a little <laughs> joke. Like, we're not playing Madden right now. We're talking right in the NFL. And then everyone was like, oh, my God, Calvin Johnson's not in Chris Carter's. But the truth (laughs) of the matter is, I forgot. (laughs) Not not that you were in the top five, but I forgot that you weren't on the list. And, And instead of me just saying, you know something, I made a mistake. So what I try to do in this podcast is, in covering the NFL over the last 20 years, if me and a guy might have had a beef or something, I allow that guy to get some get back. I think that's <laughs> only fair. <laughs> so I know you're not the type of person that would typically relish a moment like this, but could you share with us, the fans, when either your PR director or someone yeah. else, and then I think a few weeks later, I was coming to do an interview with you. Yeah, we did talk not longer after that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh man, I remember that exactly. I remember everybody was like, "Man, Chris Carter, crazy! Like he tripping." This came to me like, "Man, he don't know what he talking about." Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I was over there like, "Man, Chris, you tripping too?" <laughs> yeah. But you know what, man? You get asked that question all the time, especially like on the spot. And then mm-hmm. it's hard. I mean, shoot, it's hard for me to recall all the top five. You ask me right now, I'm gonna miss somebody, and I'm gonna feel. And then, and then they probably gonna feel some kind of way too. You know, I think somebody right. asked me that the other day, and I, I totally, I, I didn't forget about DK Metcalf, but I didn't, I, I forgot to mention him. You know, right, like, right. So it's, you know, so he could take that as a slight. You know, I, I get it, I get how it goes, man. So, so even in the prime of your career, me as a seasoned broadcaster, I, I made a, a huge, huge mistake, but. Um, I'm glad that you're not a vindictive person and, and, and don't want to hit me with the pie or anything on my own podcast. So I thank you for joining us in, in spite of my craziness. Oh, man. Come on. Now, we're coming off of just recently the Hall of Fame induction. Mm-hmm. And you being in the, a rookie in the class, you know, you really can't talk that much during the weekend. <laughs> but I wanted you to be able to give some insight. Um, to the football fans out there, to the fans of wide receivers and the fans of Calvin Johnson, what was it like to be in the room amongst the greatest football players ever? Woo. That, that, that luncheon, man, that was special because, you know, it's the like, Ray Nitschke luncheon. Yes, sir. The Ray Nitschke luncheon. Just being able to sit in there with the guys that I looked up to, 
And then the guys that I looked up to, the guys that they looked up to. And just to see the generation, the levels to it, you know, and just be able to relish in that moment and be there and sit there and listen to Willie and be able to sit at the table with you, Michael Irvin, you know, Bruce. Uh, I mean, who else was there? Like, I mean, it was just, I just sit there and just take it in, man. Just take in all the history, you know. That's what made that, that all those moments that weekend so special just to be a must. History of the game, all the guys mm-hmm. that you looked up to. You're able to share that moment with a lot of people. And I know you've got a close knit family. What was that moment like for them? Because for us as Hall of Famers, as Gold Jackets, it's a different experience. But for our family members and for our friends, um, they have some great stories typically that they can share from the weekend. How was your family and your friends experience? Man, the best thing was that party that happened after the, after the event where everybody came together. Oh, man, all my old teammates, all my family. But, you know, my family, you know, they're real, you know, they something, they're a piece of work. So I got a bunch of doctors in the family. So they're like, OK, you know, for once, you know, this is like your this is like your doctor right here. This is like your doctor, that jacket. You know, now you're on level with us because <laughs> we're actual doctors. Wow. <laughs> so they, they're tough. They're a tough crowd. That That is peer pressure. And um, Calvin, now for one, in the history of football, we've been playing a little over 100 years of professional football. You're still a big person in any era. Like, you can take you to the 20s. You're a giant. We put you on the field right now in a uniform. You are a giant. But people are somewhat surprised by some of the legendary players how big the Hall of Famers typically, like, in that room they are. Were you surprised? Not at all. That's why I mean, that's <laughs> what I would expect. You yeah. got the giants <laughs> and the legends of the game. <laughs> right. Now, with your overall size, Did you think about trying to play a different position? Because for me, if someone asked me, I want the perfect size, height, weight, and speed, I would typically say probably around 6'1 to 6'3. I agree. Um, You know, and I would probably say, I mean, I I want them fast, but I don't want them too fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want them to be able to probably run the upwards of the top of the four threes to probably around a good 4'4 or 5'. I because I know disagree. a lot of good receivers mm-hmm. run that. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. you break the charts. Like, typically, I don't like guys with a shoe size that's more than the 13 and a half. <laughs> like, because it's hard for them to have that short area uh-huh. quickness that you need yes, sir. as a wide receiver. Mm-hmm. But you defy all these things by your ginormous size and why you have one of the greatest nicknames in Megatron in the history of sport. I mean, to that point, man, that's... That's what myself and my trainer, we know. Those are the things that we knew. You know, when I came mm-hmm. into the league, for me to move in a tight space, when I was raw and first in the league, you know, I had difficulty there. I had to, I had to work at that, you know, but I had a trainer who was like, hey, man, we're going to turn you into the, to a ninja. And I bought into that. You know, I was like, I got to be right. able to move like a little guy, like a guy that's five, eight to like, like six foot. I got to be able to move like that in a small space. So that's when we just, you know, hammered in on the footwork drills, just, just getting used to those feet moving uh, at quick pace. And I mean, I mean, so many other things, obviously, to the game. And they, obviously, one thing I would I'd say I take from you is the late hands, man. That was that, that was mm-hmm. crucial, you know, and um, especially, you know, you're catching that ball down the field. So so all these other attributes, a dominant high school player, you go to Georgia Tech, mm-hmm. two times All-American there, three times All-American, I mean, um, All-Conference in the ACC there, the number two pick in the draft. I mean, you are a dominant player, but off the field, a lot of people did know this, you have sustained some injuries in your rookie season that ultimately would be a part of the reason why you decided that I'm going to shorten my career for my overall health. Yeah, I mean, playing with pain, that turns you into a different person. You know, I, I know the person that I was when I was getting up every day later later in my career. And I wasn't I wasn't the nicest person. You know, I could ask my wife. She looks sit here and tell you that herself. You know, so uh, I know how it could change you. Pain can. It kind of explain, you know, your injury issues early in your career, especially that first year, yep, yep. because I, I know when I left Ohio state and came to the Philadelphia Eagles, mm-hmm. what they thought about pain and what they were doing to try to get me out there on Sunday was totally different than what they were doing at Ohio state. 
I know you injured your your back mm-hmm. uh, your rookie year, mm-hmm. um, which required a lot of rest. But they were trying to get you out there. What did it take to get you on the oh, field yeah. on Sundays? Yeah, I hurt my back. I forget it's like probably early mid season. Uh, came down that thing, couldn't feel my legs. Got up and over the next course of the next four four weeks, I didn't play the next four weeks. Um, they had me, you know, I was hooked up to uh, the chiropractor's little traction machine where they literally had a machine around my waist, pulling, pulling mm-hmm. down and something around my shoulders and stuff, pulling my body up, you know, just to relieve the pain of those or uh, to relieve those discs um, that were a little jacked up in my back that were causing the sharp um, shooting pain. Whereas I couldn't run if every time, every step that I stuck in the ground, you know, I feel that stabbing pain in my back. So that went away, started to go away after like four weeks. They put me in that game the fifth week. I'm feeling good in warm ups. And then, but when you get in there and really, really get going and, and you take mm-hmm. that first hit and you, that thing start to come back in, it was, it was only a couple of plays before, you know, they had to pull me out of that game. So it's just lingering effects for the rest of the season. But uh, targeting my back and my workouts and in my training, it was something that had to be constant for me for the rest of my career. And even today, if I'm not working on my back right now, I'll feel it. I'll feel it when I wake up. It's feel like there's, it almost feel like just nothing there. Like I have no, 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 no control. It's just, and it's a little painful. Now, a lot of players deal with injuries, especially earlier in their career. Most players aren't able to overcome them. Mm-hmm. Now, you became such a dominant player. Um, you, you broke one of my records in Dallas, I think in 2011. In that game, uh, you scored multiple touchdowns, and I had the NFL record for scoring multiple touchdowns in four straight games. So now you and I are tied, mm-hmm. uh, knucklehead. <laughs> all right, <laughs> the company. So, <laughs> but um, you were such a dominant player, and you know I played with Randy Moss, and I saw some coverages on Randy Moss that I didn't, I never even saw on Jerry Rice. But there's not a player that's ever played that. In the goal line situation, they line two defensive backs up on you like you were like you out on the punt team. <laughs> now, that was the ultimate respect any defensive coordinator, any defense can give you. What were you thinking about when two guys lined up on you in the red zone? First time they did it, I knew I'm out to play. I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm chilling. But after they did it the first time, they came at, came with it again. I'm like, okay, we got to find a way to, we got to beat this. And I'm just like, just, <laughs> let me split them. I'm still open. Let me split them, go towards the goal post. The guy in the back, he ain't going to be a factor. Just throw it up over the guy in the fir- in front of me. Just throw it up on top of him with a dunk on him. <laughs> now, I remember a play in Chicago and ultimately probably a lot of Calvin Johnson oh, fans man. because I was part of the – of the committee that is it a catch or no catch, but we had to utilize that catch, no catch in Chicago when we helped change the rules a couple years ago. So I hope you realize that yes, sir. yourself and Dells Bryant yep. and the inability for normal football fans to know if it was a catch on Monday or Tuesday after the game, that was a problem for Roger Goodell and the people at the office. So we finally corrected was that a catch in Chicago where you <laughs> caught the ball and helped yourself up off the ground? Oh, man. Now, you know what? They, why can't they, they should go add that stat to the book. It might as well. I got a couple more they need to look at, too. <laughs> <laughs> you you already got a gold jacket. You want people to review the stats? You know what? Never mind. <laughs> Be humble. <laughs> you good? <laughs> oh, man. Now, now we know in, in Detroit, um, myself, I would I'm on the list of some of the greatest players that never won a Super Bowl. Um, yourself would be on that list also. Mm-hmm. But you personally had a lot of individual success. People don't understand even being a wide receiver and you're different than most wide receivers. How did that losing and then the grind and the physical wear and tear, how did it affect you mentally? <laughs> That's the thing, man. Well, all we do is, you know, as football players, we worry about that, that, that physical, you know, the everything below the, below the shoulders, you know, there's not a lot put into everything above the shoulders, you know, so, and that's part, that's most of the game is mental. You I know, mean, we got the physical gifts. We know how to work that body out, but it's a lot that goes mm-hmm. on in that head from, you know, anything off the field to on the field. And, uh, if you don't, you know, have the bandwidth sometimes to handle those loads, you know, you can, you know, almost self destruct. You know, in, in, a, in a, I guess a, a good, I guess the best way to say it in the shortest amount of words. If I was going to go back over the plays that made an impact on you, because what people think is an impact play and a player that played is, is is totally different. Take me through a couple of Calvin Johnson highlights 
where you were, who was defending you, down in distance. Because a lot of times we remember crazy stuff like that. <laughs> I remember one time I was in uh, Detroit. I mean, um, he, I played against a guy a bunch in Detroit, Ray Crockett. Then he went to Denver. And I remember before the game, he was talking trash to me. He's like, oh, man, I'm out here in, in, in Mount High. I'm going to give it to you today. And I remember that. And I, I went into the locker room, told the offense coordinator, man, we got to tune this dude up. We used to beat him up in Detroit. Now we're going to get him out here in Denver. Give me some of the things that people might be surprised that Calvin Johnson, besides an embarrassing moment with Chris Carter, <laughs> and you're telling your teammates, yeah, Chris is crazy. Give me some of those highlights uh, of what you thought um, were, were kind of the thrills of your career. I think one, it really was um, maybe the Rex Ryan, I think, or or his brother, one, the Ryan's brothers when they was when they're in Dallas. Or then, no, yeah, was the Rex was in Dallas. Um, when they were in Dallas, you know, they, they had a big thing going on, like where where Dez was the best receiver in the league, you know, and then <laughs> and and basically I was his understudy, you know, that I, that kind of struck a chord a little bit. So, you know, in both of those games where he was talking that mad cash, you know, I was I was I was turned up, I was ready to go and uh, and make some plays, and obviously one of them was that three hundred yard game. And the other one, uh, we went to Dallas and uh, we came back and went and then beat the boys out there in Dallas. So, I mean, that's the best feeling when you're going on, especially when you go in somebody else's stadium and, and make that thing go quiet at the end. You're one of the few people because you're with the team that has that Thanksgiving tradition. What did it mean to you? That was um, to be able to play on Thanksgiving. I grew up watching that game year after year. It, all of us mm-hmm. grew up watching those games. You know, we grew up watching Barry, yeah. you know, and that, I mean, I never would have thought it as a kid, but. You know, to be able to think I was going to play on that stage in front of everybody, everybody watching that game. You know, that was a heavy. I mean, young, I mean, early in my career, I was like, dang, you know, you would think about that, the gravity of that. You know, who all, everybody could see you play. Obviously, the, you know, the eye in the, and the eye in the, 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 the sky don't lie. So you got to be out there and ready to perform. Um, it's like a playoff game, really. You know, that's the atmosphere that we get. That's obviously that's the closest thing we really got to uh, uh, <laughs> out there in Detroit. We got there a couple of times, but. Yeah, man, that's the closest thing we're getting to a playoff atmosphere during the season. Now, you talk about coming from a very professional, um, a group of doctors, higher education, Mm -hmm. um, smart people. Um, In the era for which you played, I would say that the all-time hype on wide receivers after Jerry Rice and myself and Tim Brown, there was a lot of hype on wide receivers. And yourself and Larry Fitzgerald, you guys decided to do this a different way. And every night you're watching T.O. Um, and Chad Ochocinco, you're watching them. How do you remain within your character? And you know all these other guys are getting attention and you think you're better than them. How do you handle that? Yes. I really just, it's really for me, it was just going out and I had goals that I had set before when I came into the league. You know, I, I was mm-hmm. like, I want to play 10 years. You know, I want to have 10,000 yards. So basically having about having a thousand yards a year. And I feel like doing those things, you know, I'll have an imprint on wherever I, you know, wherever I go, you know, you know, mm-hmm. so just being, and obviously you, so you got to be on the field. You got to, you know, you got to kind of stay healthy to be able to do that. So, I mean, that was one of the, the things I did, I wanted to do. Obviously, my first year, I wasn't able to really get to that 1,000-yard that mark. My second year, I got mm-hmm. to 13. And I was like, okay, I kind of averaged out to 1,000 yards. I had 2,000 yards after two years, you know. So, like, okay, let's see what we do. Can we, can we push that? Can we, can we push that and do better? Had a couple of injuries my third year. And then um, after that third year, I had 1,000-yard seasons going, and I had some really big ones, you know. And a lot of that was due to my – I had some great coaching. I had Sean Jefferson. You know, he pushed the hell out of me my whole career. Mm-hmm. You know, great dude, Good receiver great receiver coach. coach. You know, I, I always say he's the best mm-hmm. in the league. You know, attention to detail. He mm-hmm. approached everybody at the beginning of the season asking, do you want to be great? And, you, of course, you're going to answer yes, of course. You know, well, I'm going to coach you like you want to be great. You know, that's the last thing you want to hear because we about to go, <laughs> you about to get, get busy. But that's a good thing, though, because right. we're going to work every little asset, every facet. You know, nothing's going to get mundane because we're going to take every every part of the game from the blocking to catching the ball to your footwork. And we're going to work on a certain part of it each and every day and just build good days on good days. Yeah, there, there's not a lot of – and I think when I did the feature on you, I told you this. And covering the league for 20 years, it's very, very rare. And only a handful of times, uh, Jerry Rice, Michael Irvin, Larry Fitzgerald. You're going to go into the locker room, you ask them, who's the hardest worker? And it's a wide receiver. People think all of us are divas. All of us aren't divas. 
And you were one of those lunch pail type guys. When I went to the locker room, I asked, I asked the PR director, I asked one of the trainers, who's the hardest worker in the building? And they said, Calvin Johnson is. Now, for you, you prided yourself on being a lot like Barry Sanders. And how ironic was that, that you followed after Barry, not only as far as his personality, but his overall work ethic and what you meant to the community there in Detroit? I mean, that's I mean, you see the city of Detroit, you know, it's, it's that it's that lunch pail type city. You know, everybody has to go and they go and work, work their tail off for theirs. You know, so it would make no I mean, that's how my parents were raised. My dad worked on the railroad. You know, my mom, she was an educator and she worked her way up from being a flight attendant to an educator to an administrator. So, you know, just seeing the evolution, the hard work, the the drive, you know, the, the goals that they set for themselves and watching them achieve those things. You know, just for me, it was it was simple, you know, just sit back shut up and do your job you know and um things will come to fruition if you have that if you have your vision and mindset on what you're trying to do and when you're trying to have a long career um, myself and a lot of other people there are a number of roadblocks and it becomes hard not only mentally but physically as you talked about dealing with painkillers early in your career and to me i'm one of the worst losers all time from the first time i lost so the last time I lost last night, I was playing gin rummy with my wife and she smacked me, smacked me all around. I didn't take it well. And, and, and I don't take right, losing well. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you're one of those same type of people. How did the losing and not being able to get your team to the playoffs? Because I know when they drafted you number two, you thought one day there would be a parade in Detroit and it'd be led by Calvin Johnson. And he's going to take the Lions to the Super Bowl. But after you've been through year three, Four, five, six. Yep. You have a lot of individual success. Mm -hmm. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. What were you going through and what were some of the things you thought about, which led ultimately to you calling it an early career? They, uh, I remember uh, my going into my second year, they called Roy and myself into the office and they was like, we're going to go anywhere. It's going to be on y'all's backs. <laughs> that was the co-coordinators and the coaches. I was just like, all right, cool. You know, I'm just getting getting acclimated, but let's do it. Now that's now that's Roy Williams, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. And then okay. that same year, Roy got traded to Dallas. <laughs> 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 so I was dolo out there. So I was like, all right. Right. You know, so you know, it's just you know, you just gotta grind. You know, I'm ready for it. But just give me a quarterback out here and let's let's you know, let's go to work. But, you know, not being not having success, you know, and then getting to a point where we were getting to the playoffs and then having that team dismantled, you know, that up and down. And then, you know, going about to have to go through a rebuild. I was just like, yeah, it's, it's going to take some time. It's, it's, it's clear as day that we're at what it is. My body hurts. I'm not. I mean, if we put it like this, if we had won a championship my ninth year, of course, I would want to come back. I mean, that's a whole different set of mindset and feelings going on mm -hmm. right there. But, you know, that's just the grind and then going through the, what I went through the years, a couple years before. And like I say, I was going to retire the year before until my dad kind of coached me into coming back. You know, I was I told him I was done, you know, but he was like, can you do it again? And I was like, mm, I thought about it. And when I was thinking, he was like, well, you thought about it. So you got, you got it. Right. Was that the was that the trigger? That you were thinking about it because typically, um, you know, I'm not one that grew up with a father, but typically when people, important people in your life, there's one word or something, a, a, a phrase or something that typically gets your attention. And then typically that helps you formulate the decision that helps, you know, get you on the right path or make sure that your direction to success continues. Yeah, I mean, it was just the timing of, the, of, of his comment. You know, and in the timing of the conversation, you know, just he caught me when I was sitting there thinking about it. And he's like, the fact that you're thinking about it, you know, you can do it again. You got at least one more in you. You took that retirement personal like most people. You only knew one team. Um, you're born and raised in Georgia, went to school there at Georgia Tech. Your experience in pro sports was in Detroit. Of course, you have plenty more football left in you. And then even what I saw from the Hall of Fame. There seemed to, to rekindle. It seemed to heat up the pot and kind of stir up all those thoughts that, that you and that organization might have. What would it take to be able to mend those fences between Calvin Johnson and the Detroit Lions organization? Um, really just, you know, coming to the table and, you know, just trying to figure out a way to, like I said, just to try to figure out a way to make it right. You know, um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm open to being creative and figuring that out, but uh, just to, Really just start with it just starts with a conversation. Now, Calvin, you're a guy that didn't complain throughout your career. You were the 
everything but a diva wide receiver to think that what you had done on the field, playing hurt, which a lot of people didn't know about, jeopardizing your career. You had to take it as an insult when you decided, okay, I'm going to do what I think is best for me. And then the organization comes to you and say, you know something, I want some money back. Of course, you know, I mean, that's, that's obviously why we're out. We are where we are right now. You know, I'm not going to, you can't come and take something. Is that the ultimate disrespect? Yes. Because I know the work that you put yes, in and, and that's, that's not work that, that's in your contract. That, that work that you did with Sean Jefferson, all-star receivers d- don't do that. The, the people that you take under your wing in that locker room to create an environment in the locker room where people can come and go to work. That's not in your contract. Yes, sir. It's so, yep. and, and go ahead. All those intangibles, you know, and I, I, I'm never the one to talk about to boost myself or anything like that. But there's a lot of intangibles and things that you're speaking about now that go into that, you know, and then obviously the things that you do see, the things you can grab on to, obviously. But um, of course, I took it as a, as a slap in the face. You know, I felt like, you know, there was a lot of obviously if you just talk in numbers, you know, there's a lot of my, I, I earned half my contract, put it like that, you know. And I mm-hmm. feel like it's, hey, it's okay. I, I work. I, I, I've uh, played half the contract. I've earned half the contract. You know, I'm, I'm out. I, I'm, I can't do it anymore. And, uh, you know, when they came at me, I mean, I can't come back and work for somebody that just came at me and, 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 and took from me when I was, you know, spent my whole adult life given to you, mm. you know, so. Right. So even if there was a little, because all of us, um, I tell people, all of us got a little bit of football left in us. And it, 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 and if, if put in the right situation and really the right opportunity with the right coaches and everything and the right, you know, nucleus around you. Yeah, you might be able to muster up a season or two. But when you don't have those things in place, football is a hard game to play when you're not happy. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? <laughs> hey, I, I, I can tell you. And man. one last question about Detroit, and then I'm mm-hmm. going to move on, is. You seem to be happy for another gentleman who was able to get out of Detroit to try to end his career on Mm -hmm. a pleasant note in Matthew Stafford. And he's a great leader, a great guy, Um, the franchise quarterback in Detroit from the time they drafted him. Now he's playing with the L.A. Rams. Calvin Johnson speaks up and people are like, wow. I'm happy for him, man. Um, You know, he spends a lot of time in Cali. And um, his, I know his wife loves it. He's in a happy place. You know, you where you want to be at and you get to live and work there. It's not work at all. You just, you know, he's just loving life right now. <laughs> so I can only imagine, you know, how I can only imagine the dream of how great the situation is for him. But I just hope he has success out there. And for you, you felt like not only as a football player, I'm going to be successful, but I believe that as an entrepreneur, as a as a business owner, I can be successful. So that's when you got involved into the marijuana business. You and one of your former teammates. And I want to spend a lot of time because I want our audience to be able to explain, um, because I know there's a lot of stigmas about marijuana, marijuana usage. But I believe that Calvin Johnson, the Megatron image is the perfect, especially with your family and their medical backgrounds. You could be the perfect voice to be able to bridge the gap, to be able to help a lot of athletes get off a lot of these painkillers a lot of these opiates and be able to transition into something a little more holistic because that's when I read stuff about Calvin Johnson. That's what it says. He's about holistic recovery. Can you explain to us your company primitive and some of the things you're doing? And also you've donated a lot of money to, to Harvard, to the study that they're doing on traumatic injuries and the usage of marijuana um, and how they correlate. Yes. So yeah, we got a lot of things to talk about here. So just starting personally, you know, I've always brought to the um, myself a holistic approach, you know, anything of the earth can go into my body, you know, and, you know, try to minimize those things that are uh, uh, synthetic, um, you know, and I kind of, you know, wanted to take that over to, you know, the way we treat medicine as well. And, you know, we think about back to the NFL where you were it, it, the access to the opioids or whatever medicines that, that you needed. It was there. It's easy. You know, you need a toward all shot. Go get it. You know, so. um you know, there has to be a better way. But I mean, the crime really is just having that this plant, you know, um, the stigma around this plant, you know, and not being able to research it because it's a category one. You know, it's just it's, that's what's so unfortunate because we're years behind, you know, um, 
you know, you look at Israel, they're, you know, they're, they're doing things, you know, light years ahead of what we're doing right now. But the fact that the states are, you know, rolling over and everybody's starting to you know, implement their uh, legislation on, on cannabis, you know, it's allowing us to, you know, move ahead and really trying to find a more natural, holistic way, like you mentioned earlier, uh, to treat ourselves. And, and for us, the focus um, is pain. And, uh, and, um, and I like to say just, uh, cognitive disorders, you know, not just centered around CTE. Obviously, CTE is, uh, is huge in, in football community, military and all sports, but, um, just really trying to find ways to, um, to, to find solutions for pain and, uh, and, and cognitive disorders. And, and you've been doing this for a number of years. Give me some of the, the information that you found out through, uh, your relationship with, with Harvard University and the studies. Why should athletes be transitioning into something more holistic like this? So Harvard's partnered with like Dana Farber and it's called the uh, health, the global health catalyst. So there's this consortium of companies from, um, you know, Harvard, to John Hopkins to Penn and, and, and go, the list goes on. Um, other private companies as well, you know, that are that are in the holistic natural um, medicine um space. So I think the biggest thing that I've learned and, and one of the companies from the consortium is called Nestry. And that's three is imagine uh, weight training for the mind, you know, and this is going, we're talking about cognitive uh, issues. Um, imagine uh, it's called neuroplasticity. And that's literally the ability to rebuild uh, neurons in the brain so that, you know, you could imagine building muscles in the gym, you know, you could rebuild your brain. So, uh, you know, my, my friend, Dr. Tommy Shavers, he's the CEO of Nestry down there. Um, actually, Tommy Shavers, he helped me. Uh, he, he assisted me in writing my speech. Um, for the Hall of Fame. He did a great job with me, um, helped me put all my thoughts on paper. But um, he's the CEO and, and down there in Lake Nona, Florida, they, they have Nestry in there. We're going to be unveiling um, an app here soon. And it's really just a, a mind training app. Like I say, it's a uh, weight training for the brain. And I look forward to, uh, you know, helping people, you know, uh, build back, you know, what, what may have been lost, especially, especially cognitively. And not only um, the doctor that you mentioned, but there's another doctor, um, I know I've read a lot of the material, um, Wilford, and he's doing a lot of real research. What is his part? Um, what part has he played in in what you've learned? So Wilfred is pretty much the catalyst that brings this, this all together um, over there at Harvard. So it's, it's, he is he is the one that helped us to get into uh, the uh, research side of it, you know, and helped to turn us into a research company. You know, so that's that's the awesome part about it, because you're really not going to learn. We're really not going to grow and advance uh, the, the stigma on cannabis until people really learn and educate themselves about it. And a part of that goes into learning more about it through research. And then the, another great thing about it, sorry, Chris, is just that yeah, I heard the NFL has just uh, I think they have like a million dollar grant, maybe or something like that to uh, yeah, towards plants, plant medicine. Yeah. Also, the conversation has continued through the last collective bargaining mm-hmm. agreement that. They've decreased mm-hmm. the nanograms mm-hmm. as far as the players. Um, that means that is the nanograms is how they measure how much THC is in the system of the player and is able to tell them when was the last time that they recently smoked or how often they've been smoking because um, it stays with you the, 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 the longer. So they decrease that. The time for which um, they can test the players um, has decreased because of, of players like you and the information that you're given the, the NFL and the, the the really dramatic suspensions. Like if Josh Gordon was in man. the NFL today, it would save oh, it man. would save his career. Um but potentially. Mm-hmm. Now people also try to use this stigma as if that marijuana is the is the gateway <laughs> drug. <laughs> if there's any drug that's the gateway drug is alcohol. <laughs> Because alcohol is involved in anything that we do, any celebration or in any other type of of, of substance. So I'm glad that there are people like yourself, Calvin, out there sharing this information so that for me, what I'm looking at as an NFL legend, what can Calvin Johnson and his research and his team bring to, to our community? Because we got guys that are losing cognitive function on a daily basis. We have some of our greatest football players. They don't know if today's Thursday or Tuesday. And a lot of these stories we don't talk about, Calvin, but I'm so glad that you're involved in something like this to educate not only the community, but so that we can remove some of these stigmas. Those are the stories, man, that are that, that inspire us, man. Just hearing the stories of our brothers, man, that, that are that, that have passed, 
that are going through these issues that, I mean, that fires us up to do this that 100% to try to find solutions in this space. Now, some people always wonder with a player like yourself, when you transition from having such a great job in the NFL, did you feel like calling to do something like this? Did you feel a higher purpose? Because to me, this is, this can be more important than what you did on the field. Those 1,900 yards you had to break the NFL record. It could be more important than, than, than that season. You know, when it really hit me, Chris, was I was, <laughs> don't laugh, I was doing the dang dancing with the stars show, right? And mm -hmm. I was about to quit the show because my ankles started swelling up. They're ballooning on me, and I'm like, I can't move. I can't do this. No, tip, tap, wow. tap, 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 uh, whatever, the cha-cha. I can't do it. You know, and it's my buddy. And you still finished third. Yeah, I did. But the, the only reason why was because my buddy, he went to school with me, Osahan Tongo. He's in film out there in California. You know, he brought me a topical, and I used it. And then over the next couple of days, I'm like, okay, my swelling's starting to go down. And I'm doing other mm -hmm. things, too. My swelling stayed down. And I'm like, hold up, man. And that's the only constant that's really that I have right now is this topical. So that's why my swelling is staying down. I'm like, okay, there's something to this. Let's get to the science behind this. Mm, so you continue to learn. Now, for coaches out there, parents out there that are concerned about young people, what does Calvin say about young people and his advice to them? Uh, I would say young people in cannabis use, uh, uh, honestly – when you're talking about like more recreational um, sense of it yes. and smoking it, that doesn't mix. Well, that's what I think people are concerned yeah. about. I, and that's what we, we are. Yeah. We don't want to get caught up thinking of just about the recreational side. You want to think about this medicinally. That's the only way you, mm -hmm. you advance the advance the industry. You know, if you're thinking about it uh, from the recreation, I expect, then you're just thinking about money of it, the money that comes from it. But when you're thinking about it medicinally, yeah, that's when you are, that's when you're able to in, 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 in enable uh, and able to do the research and push and advance the industry. And from a pain management standpoint, I know myself, um, I still have pain, neck, shoulder pain um, from procedures done or playing in, in the NFL. And we got hundreds and hundreds of former NFL players that they have a hard time getting up every day. I play golf with my man, Dan Marino. He just <laughs> had double knee replacement surgery. Like, so from a pain management standpoint, especially with, the fear for opiates, we need something besides what they're prescribing to us at the doctor. Well, yeah, I mean, pain management and a big part of it is sleep. You know, a lot of people don't get to, can't mm -hmm. get to sleep because of the pain that they're dealing with, you know. And that's one thing that we know for sure that uh, that this plant medicine can definitely help with. But um, like I say, there's a lot more research to be done. And don't worry, I'm going to be right there um, <laughs> with the bullhorn, like letting you guys know what's up. Where, 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 so what's next? Going? What's next for Calvin Johnson? What's uh, next for your company? What is the cutting edge um, research that you might be working on? I think um, really what's next right now is 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 the brain brain training. That's going to be the next thing that's going to be released for us. Um, our brand uh, primitive that's already been released, but um, the brain training with Nestry. Um, really trying to help the guys that we're talking about right now with the cognitive issues. You know, that's really mm -hmm. a right now um, issue, yesterday issue. You know, that's that that um, that we need that we need to help our brothers with. And he, my guy Tommy, he's seen success down there with guys like the guys like Josh McCown, older guys that have you know contemplated retirement. You know, have gone down there and mm -hmm. seen them, and, and they've kept on with their career. You know, um, I wish I'm, I probably wish I would have known Tommy when I was a little younger, maybe. But you know, that's right. you know that's that's uh, that's in hindsight. But you know, I, I, I love what he's doing. With his program and i'm happy to be an ambassador well calvin johnson it's been a delight to communicate with you oh. i mean you're cha still changing the world even though you changed the world as as megatron <laughs> your people's alter ego <laughs> and halloween's coming up people are megatron um all around the united states but what you're doing for people that can manage their pain that people might be able to help with their cognitive skills and who you are as a human being a representative of the, of the great state of Georgia and now representing gold jackets all around the world. Calvin, I greatly appreciate it. You were always one of my favorite players. And to be able to do what you did at the size for which you did it, uh, that's the reason um, why you might sleep in Georgia, but you reside currently in Canton, Ohio. <laughs> my man. Thank you, Chris, man. All love, bro. All love, man. Special thanks to Calvin Johnson, and thanks for listening to Wide Receiver One, a Blue Wire podcast presented by WinBet. 
And don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Chris Carter. Catch you next week.